Chapter 16 The Imperial Prerogatives of Jesus Christ The New Testament is emphatic about the imperial prerogatives of Jesus Christ. St. Paul speaks of this as the inescapable and inevitable fact of history. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 9-11 There shall be no exceptions to Christ's universal sway. Before the end of the world, all things shall be under Christ's dominion, and all men, and then the last enemy, death, is destroyed. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15, 24-26 This is only natural, for Christ is the one of whom we must say, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Colossians 1, 17 He is the Word made flesh. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 3 John tells us that Jesus declares, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Revelation 1, 8 The word from heaven to earth is, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for ever and ever. Revelation 11.15 There are no exceptions to this universal sway, for Jesus Christ is the universal King and Lord. King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19.16 For any state to attempt to control Christ's realm is an unmitigated evil. There is still another term applied to Jesus Christ, which is an attribute of God, Ephesians 1.17, and central to ancient Oriental concepts of absolute royal power, the possession of the glory. Jesus Christ was very clearly seen by the New Testament writers as the Lord of glory, James 2.1. Oriental kings and emperors of great power were seen as the face of God on earth, They were the personal representations of God and time. They were the threshold and hence the mediators of God. As such, they were the possessors of the divine glory. The king was seen as the revelation of the glory and, quote, the form of the court of the king is preserved in the shape of our churches, end quote. The altar is the throne of the grace, and, quote, the sanctuary within the real the place reserved for the circle of the friends of the king, end quote. This concept of kingship is essential to an understanding of the world of the Old Testament nations and the world of the New Testament era. The deity in all being manifested its glory in the great kings and in their states. Every reference to the glory of God is also a denial of the glory of earthly kings. When Herod, who should have known better, sought to claim the glory, God struck him down for this profanation within the still-standing temple realm. Herod had clothed himself in garments designed to reflect the sun, being made holy of silver, according to Josephus. The servile mob hailed King Agrippa as a god, declaring him to be obviously more than a man. Quote, And upon a set day Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, 
It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not God the glory, and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. Acts 12, 21 to 24. Buckler called attention to the status of those whom the King of Glory took into his household. First, they were called friends, as Jesus does, all who keep his commandments, John fifteen sixteen. The word translated as friends is phylos in the Greek, and, when used by a monarch, means princes of grace, because all whom a king makes a friend, he makes a prince of the royal household and family. The same word is translated as princes in the Septuagint version of Esther 1.16. Second, all who are taken into the royal family by grace are clothed by the great king as his children. The necessity of being clothed by the great king is clearly set forth by our Lord in the parable of the wedding feast, Matthew 22.1-14. The king's robe of glory, his holiness and justice, cover his adopted children. To refuse his covering is to refuse him. Third, the princes of grace, who by adoption are made members of the royal household, sit at the royal feast. The Lord's table is the royal feast, the visible witness of his providential care for his own. Buckler pointed out, quote, To partake of the royal feast is to pledge oneself to be a member of the king's body. In the words of the prayer of consecration, quote, that we receiving these by creatures of bread and wine may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. End quote. Fourth, those who put on Christ put on also the royal righteousness as opposed to a servile righteousness. The royal righteousness manifests the glory of God in joyful obedience to his law word whereas servile righteousness is fearful and slavish obedience. Fifth, by defeating on the cross the power of sin and death, Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, defeated the power of the prince of darkness in the very world he had corrupted and captured. Now this world could be reconquered and the glory of God manifested in every area of life and thought. Sixth, to ensure the continuity of Christ's kingdom on earth, the church was established to extend over all the earth the crown rights of the Lord of glory and to make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 18-20. So great is the supernatural power of Christ's true and faithful church that the very gates of hell cannot prevail or hold out against it, Matthew 16, 18. Seventh, to make clear this fact, God the Lord at Pentecost used an ancient symbol of royal glory to manifest his spirit. According to Acts 2, 1 4, quote, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. End quote. A great blazing light or fire is the ancient symbol of glory. At Pentecost, it was not one fire nor one tongue of light which appeared, but tongues of flame. Previously, a tongue of fire had been carried before great kings such as Cyrus, Darius and Alexander the Great to signify their claim to be the lights of glory. These were all man-made flames because they were man-made claims to the divine glory. Now at Pentecost, it was God the Spirit who brings the fire and it comes to all who are the called of God. To cite Buckler again, quote, the Holy Spirit is the divine royal glory of the kingdom of God established on earth by our Lord. The doctrines of his divinity and place in the Trinity as of the same being, homo oseon, with the Father and the Son, from whom it proceeds, is the church's assignment to its source of the glory, which is hers through her Lord. From the possession of the glory proceeds the royal righteousness. 
It is this fact which is symbolized in the sacrament of confirmation, which is, in reality, the chiefest of all sacraments, for it is the epiphany of each son of man. End quote. The ascendancy of the King of Glory, Jesus Christ, to all the pretended Kings of Glory is most obvious. To suggest that Christ's realm should be controlled or licensed by pretenders is absurd and blasphemous. The modern state, through many symbols, claims to be the bearer of the true glory. This is less true technically of the United States than of other countries, because our constitution omits all claims to sovereignty, although this claim has been reintroduced by the courts. In spite of this, we do have the reference to the flag as Old Glory. This is not all. Every faithful believer is the temple of the Holy Ghost. By his grace he is made the habitation of God's glory. He thus possesses what kings and states have claimed but do not have, the glory of God. Hence, while the Christian is commanded under God to submit to rulers, this can never be a total nor an unqualified submission, because the believer is in the world but not of the world. John 15:19. The ungodly are of this world, John 8.23. Our Lord is clear that his kingdom is not of or derived from this world, John 18.36. This world, therefore, has no right to control it. We must never forget that in the Old Testament, the temple and holy of holies was God's palace and throne room. How seriously this fact had to be taken is apparent in Psalm 24. This psalm celebrates God's absolute sovereignty over all things, verses 1 and 2. It gives us the grounds of admission to the royal presence, verses 3 to 6. Then the gates of Jerusalem, but metaphorically all creation, are summoned to open to the King of Glory, verses 7 to 10. The, quote, everlasting doors, end quote, are to open to the everlasting King of Glory, quote, the earth is the Lord's, and fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Psalm 24, 1-10 The New Testament tells us that Jesus Christ is this Lord of glory. It is thus the duty of the modern states to let him in and to submit to him not to control him.